crucifixion. Six thousand rebel prisoners were crucified along the Appian Way, a major Roman road, when the Roman army crushed the Spartacus Rebellion in 70 BC. During the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, Roman soldiers crucified up to 500 people per day. According to Josephus, the number was so great, quote, there was not enough room for the crosses and not enough crosses for the bodies, end quote. The Roman government had strong belief in capital punishment as a deterrent and utilized crucifixion liberally. Crucifixion was the expected form of execution for political insurgents. Stringing up hated or convicted people on a stake or tree has been practiced in many cultures dating back to ancient times. Crucifixion, however, was considered a particularly cruel form of execution to the point of obscenity. The Romans are thought to have adopted the practice from the Carthaginians in the 3rd century BC. Roman crucifixion was the, quote, supreme penalty, end quote, summa supplica, followed in order of severity by the less severe forms of execution, of being burned alive and decapitation. Rome used crucifixion as a form of capital punishment for six centuries until it was eliminated from the Roman judicial system by the Emperor Constantine. Constantine's written decree abolishing crucifixion has not survived, and its exact date is unknown. When crucifixion finally ceased in the Roman Empire is not precisely known, but it apparently did not persist beyond Constantine's reign being crucified, the condemned prisoner, called the Crucurius, was placed in the custody of an execution team of Roman soldiers. The executioners were supervised by a centurion. To begin with, the naked victim was tied to a post and scourged over the whole body. The scourging whip, called flagrum or flagellum, consisted of leather strips with dumbbell-shaped pieces of lead tied to the ends of the strips. In Hebrew law, scourging beyond forty lashes was not permitted. Romans had no lash limit, however, only the victim should not be beaten to death prior to crucifixion. Multiple soldiers participated in scourging each victim. Scourging and torture prior to crucifixion was grisly, and brought the condemned victim close to death. It is easily conceivable that the lashes would cut deeply through the flesh. The 4th century church historian, Eusebius, described scourging practices prior to crucifixion, quote, Bystanders were struck with amazement when they saw them lacerated with scourges even to the innermost veins and arteries, so that the hidden inward parts of the body, both their bowels and their members, were exposed to view, end quote. The first century Roman philosopher Seneca noted that the crucifixion victim, quote, would have many excuses for dying even before mounting the cross, end quote. After scourging, the arms of the condemned prisoner were outstretched and tied to a single straight plank of wood called the patibulum. The patibulum had an estimated weight of 60 pounds, 27 kilograms, and would become the horizontal piece of the cross. The condemned prisoner was then forced to parade through town naked carrying the patibulum and a sign called the titulus crucis, stating the capital offenses for which they were being executed. Jesus appears to have been spared the humiliation of walking naked to the crucifixion site. However, his clothes were taken from him prior to crucifixion. Matthew 27, 31 and verse 35. The condemned prisoner with arms nailed to the patibulum was then lifted and placed on the stipus, the vertical section of the cross, which was in a fixed location and stationary. The titulus crucius was fastened to the cross as a public notice of the convicted crimes. The crucifixion site was conspicuously located near the city. Crucifixion was a public spectacle intended to instill fear. To be lifted onto the cross is a literary expression found in both ancient Greek and Latin. Jesus himself used this expression when he foretold his crucifixion. Jesus said, When I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself, now he said this to indicate clearly what kind of death he was going to die. John twelve thirty two to 33 Jesus again made reference to arms being fastened to a patibulum prior to crucifixion when he foretold how Peter would die. Jesus told Peter, I tell you the solemn truth, when you were young, you tied your clothes around you and went wherever you wanted, but when you are old, 
you will stretch out your hands, and others will tie you up and bring you where you do not want to go. Now Jesus said this to indicate clearly by what kind of death Peter was going to glorify God. John 21.18-19 It is traditionally understood that Peter was crucified upside down, preaching to his executioners until he died. Positioning of victims on the cross could vary depending on the sadistic mood of the executioners. The Roman philosopher Seneca noted that, quote, some hang a man head downwards, some force a stick upwards through his groin, some stretch out his arms on a forked gibbet, also called patibulum, end quote. When Roman soldiers crucified hundreds of people per day during the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, Josephus reported that victims were placed on crosses in various postures, quote, by way of jest, after they had been tortured with all sorts of tortures, end quote. The nails. Arms and legs were typically fastened with nails, but ropes might be used if nails were in short supply. A nail through the mid-palm could potentially be unstable and pull through the flesh between the fingers from the force of the victim's body weight, but a nail placed through the wrist bones, called carpal bones, or above the wrist would be stable and hold the victim on the cross. The French surgeon Pierre Barbet experimented by hammering a large nail through wrists that had been freshly amputated. He found that a 100-pound force would pull the nail out through between the fingers if nailed in the mid-palm. Barbet felt the nail needed to be stable to at least 240 pounds of force. He found that hammering the nail through the wrist separated the wrist bones, called carpal bones, and the nail passed through destote space, the area bounded by the hamet, capitate, triquetral and lunate bones, without fracturing the wrist bones. He did this over a dozen times and found nail placement with each to be consistent. When dissecting the wrists after his nail experiment, Barbet found that the median nerve had been macerated and fragmented. This kind of injury to the median nerve in the wrist would cause intense pain in the hand and up the arm. Thus, Barbet found that nails could be consistently driven through the wrist bones at destitute space and were able to hold the weight of the victim hanging on the cross. It has been commonly assumed that nails were driven through the top of the victim's feet. Artists typically portray Jesus' feet nailed to a small block of wood, called the suppidanium, fastened to the front of the vertical section of the cross, the stipes. The suppidanium is the product of artistic imagination, however, and was not part of Roman crucifixion practice. Nails piercing the top of Jesus' feet may also be an artistic invention. Archaeological evidence suggests it may actually have been common practice to hammer a nail through the heel. How many people were crucified by the Romans is unknown, but must have numbered in the hundreds of thousands. Yet, at this writing, archaeologists have found the remains of only two crucifixion victims. In 1968, bones showing clear evidence of crucifixion were found by archaeologists in the Giv'at Hamitvar area of Jerusalem. The victim is thought to have died in the early part of the first century. Both heel bones, called the calcani, were found in an ossuary immersed in a syrupy liquid, stuck together and covered with a thick calciferous crust. The right calcaneus, the heel bone, had a large iron nail still in place. The tip of the nail was bent, making it impossible to remove. Removing the body from the cross would have been problematic with the right foot, secured in place by the bent nail. A horizontal cut mark on the right talus, part of the ankle joint, is thought to indicate that the right foot was amputated with an axe or hatchet in order to remove the body from the cross and then pry the foot and bent nail from the stipes. A nail had also been driven through the left calcaneus also, but had been removed. An indentation on the right radius, the large bone in the forearm, is thought to be evidence that a nail had been driven between the forearm bones, the radius and ulna, just above the wrist. There were no signs of injury to bones within the wrists or hands. The bones in both legs were fractured, consistent with the practice of cruriphragium, that is fracturing the legs during crucifixion. Remnants of olive wood were still present between the right heel and the head of the nail, indicating that the feet were held in place with a plaque of wood. A nail was then driven through the wood, and heel bones 
into the vertical section of the cross, the stipes. Fragments of wood were also present on the bent tip of the nail. The only other archaeological find of a crucifixion victim was discovered in 2007 in the Gavello region of northern Italy. The body had been buried directly in the earth without a coffin. Similar to the Jerusalem find, there is a hole through the right calcaneus, the heel bone, apparently a puncture wound from a nail. The nail had been driven into the calcaneus, medially to laterally, from the inside of the heel to the outside. The nail had been removed and was not found with the remains. The left calcaneus was not found. None of the other skeletal remains had traumatic markings. The victim was a male, confirmed by DNA testing, with an estimated age in his early 30s. The skeletal remains dates to the Roman era, but carbon dating was not possible due to the poor condition of the bones. The heel bones, from the remains at Givat Hamidvar, suggest that the victim's feet were nailed to the front of the cross, with the legs adjacent, and rotated to the victim's right. The feet of the Gavello victim may have been nailed to the cross in the same way, or possibly in a frog leg or open position. From a utilitarian standpoint, it was likely easier to drive a nail through the side of the heel than through the top of the foot of a protesting victim. A piece of wood between the heel and head of the nail would in effect enlarge the head of the nail, making it essentially impossible to pry the foot loose. It is also noteworthy that many consider God's statement to the serpent, Satan, in the Garden of Eden to be the first messianic prophecy, I will put hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. Her offspring will attack your head, and you will attack her offspring's heel. Genesis 3 verse 15. It may seem peculiar that remains of crucifixion victims are so rare, but their bodies were seldom buried. After death, corpses were left hanging on the cross to be devoured by scavenging animals. The low height of the typical Tau cross made dead bodies easily accessible to scavengers. No doubt, decaying bodies being eaten by animals added to the public fear and intimidation intended by the Romans. Shape of the Cross Romans executed prisoners by suspending them in a variety of positions. A simple upright stake or pole has been called the crux simplex. Based on a description from Seneca, a first-century Roman philosopher, a simple stake, crux simplex, was used to impale victims. Seneca stated, I see before me crosses not all alike, but differently made by different peoples. Some hang a man head downwards, some force a stick upwards through his groin, some stretch out his arms on a forked gibbet. End quote. According to tradition, St. Andrew, one of Jesus' original twelve disciples, is thought to have been executed on a crux decusata, an X shaped frame that has become known as the St. Andrew's Cross. Documents stating St. Andrew was executed on a crux decusata do not appear until the 10th century, however. Some historians doubt that this was used in the 1st century. Historical and literary evidence seem to be clear that the predominant method of Roman crucifixion was with the prisoner's arms outstretched on a cruciform structure. The Greek word translated cross in the Gospels is storos. In ancient classical Greek, this had the specific meaning of an upright stake in the ground. This has caused some disagreement regarding the shape of the cross used for Jesus. The conundrum arises from a misunderstanding of New Testament language. The New Testament was written in Koine Greek, meaning common dialect Greek, a post-classical form of Greek that was the lingua franca of the first century Mediterranean world. Koine Greek transcended national boundaries and had variations in form as well as spoken vernacular. Translating Koine Greek as if it were classical Greek would introduce error in the translated text. Storos in the New Testament is translated as cross, and in general terms means the instrument of death used by Romans for crucifixion. However, it is also used with the specific meaning of the horizontal section of the cross carried by the prisoner to the execution site, namely the patibulum. For example, Stauros means patibulum, when Jesus said to his followers, Whoever does not take up his cross, Storos, and follow me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, verse 38. Most artistic depictions of Jesus on a cross show him on a crux emissa, with the vertical part of the cross extending above the horizontal beam. 
However, this is an artistic interpretation and appears to be erroneous. Literary references to crucifixion, including those external to the Bible, indicate the T-shaped Tau cross, named for the Greek letter Tau, and shaped like the capital T in the English language, was the typical shape of cross construction. The cross was an implement of torture and death. For this reason, images of Jesus on the cross are not found in early Christian iconography. What may be the earliest known depiction of Jesus on a cross is actually sacrilegious graffiti mocking the faith of a Christian named Alexamenos. The graffito blasphemo, blasphemous graffiti, is thought to date to the early 3rd century, around 200 AD. It was etched in plaster and depicts Alexamenos worshipping a figure on a cross, having a human body with a donkey's head. Interestingly, Tertullian, 160 AD to 220 AD, noted that it had become popular in Rome to ridicule the Christian God as a human having features of an ass. It is noteworthy that the graffito blasphemo depicts a Tau cross. By the second century, it had become common practice among Christians to make the sign of the cross on their foreheads. The symbol used was the Tau, T, identical to the English capital T shape. Crucifixes were not utilized in Christian faith and practice until the 6th century, three centuries after Roman crucifixion had been abolished. Artists making crucifixes in medieval paintings had never seen crucifixion. The awkward carpentry of the crux emissa made it impractical for routine use. Also, it would be essentially impossible for a condemned prisoner to single-handedly carry the weight of an entire assembled cross to the crucifixion site. The weight of an entire cross would likely exceed 300 pounds, 136 kilograms. From a practical standpoint, a short crux camisa, T-shaped cross, made more sense and is most consistent with known Roman crucifixion practices. Lucian of Samosata, circa 125 to 180 AD, provides further non-Christian literary evidence for the cross shape. Lucian uses the Greek alphabet in his satirical play called trial in the court of the vowels. Lucian writes, Men weep and bewail their lot and curse Cadmus, Greek god credited with introducing the Greek alphabet, with many curses for introducing Tau T into the family of letters. They say it was his body that tyrants took for a model, his shape that they imitated when they set up the erections on which men are crucified, end quote. Lucian clearly stated that the shape of the cross was the Greek letter Tau, T. With reasonable certainty, Jesus was crucified on a crux camisa, a T-shaped cross, having a height of six to eight feet. Jesus would have been eye to eye with his executioners while hanging on the cross. Construction of the cross. The long vertical piece of the cross, the stipes, was permanently fixed in the ground. The shorter horizontal section of the cross, the patibulum, was carried by the condemned prisoner to the crucifixion site. The arms were then nailed to the patibulum. Soldiers lifted the patibulum with the attached victim up onto the stipus. The patibulum was held in place on top of the stipes by a mortise and tenon joint. The feet were then nailed to the stipes. This type of construction created an easily assembled T-shaped Tau cross, crux camisa, having a height of 6 to 8 feet, 1.8 to 2.5 meters. The height of the stipes needed to be within arm's reach so that soldiers could lift the patibulum and place it on top. Crosses needed to be easily assembled with the victim's arms already nailed to the patibulum. Ease of construction would be particularly important if soldiers were tasked with multiple executions. It should not be overlooked that Roman crucifixion was a centuries-old practice and well perfected by Jesus' time. Julius Firmicus Maternus, was a Roman writer, astrologer, and Christian apologist who lived in the early 4th century during Constantine's reign. He would have had first-hand knowledge of Roman crucifixion practices. Firmicus Maternus' description of crucifixion confirms the practice of lifting the victim onto the cross with arms already attached to the patibulum, noting, The condemned man, having been nailed to the patibulum, is raised up onto the cross, end quote. Tall crosses referred to as the crux sublimus, could be used on rare occasions for famous or politically important prisoners. 
Complex carpentry made tall crosses impractical for routine use, however. Therefore, the shorter version of the Tau cross, Crux Camisa, was used routinely. It can be assumed that the shorter cross version would have been used for Jesus since he was insignificant from the Roman point of view. There are some literary references to a sedile, a seat, perhaps halfway down from the top of the cross. This was not intended to provide comfort, rather the sedile would have the shape of a horn with the intent of increased torture. Crucifixion was a routine form of Roman execution. The carpentry demands of adding seats to crosses when it served no real purpose makes it unlikely that this was routinely done. Certainty of death. The soldier's task was to see that prisoners were successfully executed. Crucifixion teams were made up of professional soldiers who knew their job. They were trained in how to deliver a death blow. A sword or spear impaling the chest in the direction of the heart, as described in Jesus' case, would be the most straightforward way to deliver a coup de grace. This would collapse the lung and rupture the heart. Impaling the chest with a sword or spear may have been common practice in Roman crucifixion. Discipline within the Roman military was austere, if not inhumane. A guard who was caught nodding off and falling asleep during his watch was beaten to death, for example. Crucifixion teams were professional soldiers and experienced in executing prisoners. It can be safely assumed that soldiers on an execution team were credibly able to pronounce death. It was their job to assure that each condemned prisoner die. If a criminal convicted of a capital offense escaped crucifixion, it would mean certain death for the centurion and his soldiers. With reasonable certainty, Jesus died by crucifixion. A spear through the center of Jesus' chest finished the job and reassured the soldiers that he was irrefutably dead.